as teachers, in our effort to get through the stuff we need to get through, have we forgotten about teaching critical thinking skills? And the reality is, is I think maybe we may have. And over the last two years, and now that we're sort of in this space of post-pandemic teaching, I think one of the things we have to recognize is that a lot of that time during the pandemic, we were really focusing on just getting some stuff done. And maybe we forgot a lot about critical thinking because a lot of the activities that we were used to doing that would help support and build that critical thinking, the discussions, the modeling, that was really hard to do online school. Especially if you had a whole lot of kids working asynchronously, that was not the conditions under which we were teaching. So now that we are in this post-pandemic world with the explosion of AI technology that is hitting the regular consumer or the regular person where we now have access to things like ChatGPT or Canvas Magic Write. All of those things are out there. It is becoming more and more imperative that as teachers, we start focusing our instruction on building that critical thinking piece. It is one of the reasons I think there are gaps in student ability and learning that we're seeing students struggle with some content area knowledge, with the content of say an inquiry based pedagogy in our classroom. A lot of it boils down to sort of a gap in a student's ability to use critical thinking skills to be able to learn. So let's dig into what exactly is this problem, what's created it, and how we can start bringing back some critical thinking lessons and build that skill set within our students. Welcome to the Ignite Your Teaching video podcast, where we help elementary teachers to make good teaching easy again. I'm your host, Patty Firth, mom of three, wife, and experienced classroom teacher who's made it my mission to help other teachers establish efficient routines, find effective solutions, and deliver engaging lessons over at madlylearning.com. So are you ready to ignite your teaching? So what is critical thinking? Critical thinking in our students is not just the ability to regurgitate information that they have learned, but it is about allowing students to analyze what they are reading, what they are doing, to think about what they're doing, to gather resources from multiple sources and to draw conclusions from it, to analyze information that they read, to decide whether it is accurate, whether it's the stuff that they need to be learning and to sort of be able to sort and sift through that information. We also want them to be able to summarize what they have read and sort of get the gist of things that they were reading, understand the author's message and the point. We also want them to evaluate. We want them to evaluate the content of what they are doing. We want them to come to a conclusion, to draw conclusions from the information that they have gathered, to form their own opinions. And we want them to be synthesizing. Critical thinkers are able to synthesize all of the information and be able to make decisions, be able to put it all together from various sources and make sense of it all. Now, these are higher order thinking skills. And these are things that obviously we need to build some foundation first, but we need to move our students into these circumstances. Now it's going to be challenging, but in the end, when they have some of these critical thinking skills, we're going to get students that are finally going to be able to start tackling some of the more complex thinking structures that we are supposed to be assessing. It's not just about gathering their knowledge and understanding. In our assessments, we have to have a variety of assessments. We need to be able to assess not just their knowledge and understanding. That's one co one component of our assessment. But we also need to understand their ability to communicate their ideas, their thinking, and their ability to apply what they have learned to new contexts. All of those three other domains are where the critical thinking piece comes in. But as teachers, we also have to explicitly teach those critical thinking skills. Now, this is especially important in the junior grades. In the K to two, K to three space, in primary or pre-elementary grades, in the junior grades where we're really looking at students transitioning, if we're thinking about their reading skills and their ability to understand and analyze and th synthesize and evaluate the information, they have to be able to read it and they have to be able to understand it. That reading component, if you think about Scarborough's reading rope, 
um, your when they hit the grade four, grade five, grade six and beyond space, this is where they're starting to transition from learning how to read to reading to learn. It's exactly at this point in time as junior teachers that we need to start building this skill of critical thinking. It is the prime time where we can start taking the skills that they've developed as learning how to read and now teaching them what to do with this new skill. How do we look at information? How do we decode the vocabulary in what we're reading? How do we figure out and make sense of all of the things that we're doing? All of these things are really important to be able to do in order to move into that critical thinking space. Building these critical thinking skills in this era, in this time in our, in our lives, in this space where technology is growing, it is so important that students are developing this critical thinking skill because there's a lot of things that AI can do that just gives us that basic knowledge and understanding. I can ask a computer to answer me a very simple basic knowledge and understanding question, but I can't exactly get that computer to be able to make decisions because of it or to gather in a variety of information and decide what I need to present and how. Computers can only take us so far, but they certainly are going to be covering this knowledge and understanding. And in the next, if our students are 10 now, by the time they're 30 and fully in their careers, what is the world and technology going to look like and how is that going to have developed? Well, the one piece that's going to be really, really critical is critical thinking, because there's certain things that computers aren't necessarily going to be able to do as well as a human being. They're not going to be able to, at this point, maybe it'll change in 20 years, but we want to be able to get them to teach the ability to make decisions based on gathered information. So we start that now because that really is our duty. It's the world in which they're going to go into. Yes, they need to have that knowledge and understanding, but we also need to teach them what to do with it. And this is a skill deficit. I would say this is a huge skill deficit for our students, especially after really the last three years. Any of the work that has been getting done has definitely been focused on the knowledge and understanding piece, just learning the content and doing some stuff. We weren't able to do group work because students couldn't move or mix and mingle. We couldn't go on field trips. We couldn't have those science experiments where we were all sort of gathered around an exploding volcano and watching what was happening. All of that that really helps to build that critical thinking piece wasn't happening. We were simply giving our students some work, something they could read, and a bunch of questions that they could answer. So now that we know that this is something we need to move towards, we need to start pushing our students into thinking, how are we going to teach them these critical thinking pieces? How are we going to build the structures inside our classroom? How are we going to transform and change the things we've been doing for the last couple of years to fill in the gaps that are definitely there for our students and start moving into this critical thinking space where real good teaching happens. It's why they need us and can't just simply go online and work on their own. Students need teachers to teach them these skills, to give them these experiences, because that is where real good experiential critical thinking is happening. So what are we going to focus on as teachers? So if we're gonna be teaching critical thinking skills, what does that actually mean? What should it look like in our classrooms? Well, we want to have a nice balance, but we want to be focusing on the knowledge and understanding, but that is one small component. We wanna make sure they know the content, sure. But we also wanna make sure that all of the things we're doing, there is more opportunities for students to analyze, synthesize, and evaluate information. So instead of just asking students basic understanding questions, so if we give them a text that they're reading, we don't just want to give them questions that have them recall information or find all of the information inside the text. We also want to make sure that the work that they're doing is asking them to draw, make their own conclusions, evaluate the information, to apply what they have learned there into a different context. So how might this change what happens in your school? How might this change your own perspective? Having those higher order thinking questions that are not just simply a knowledge and understanding based question, 
but to ensure that when we are asking for a written question, if we are asking any of those question and answer type activities, that there is opportunities for students to be analyzing the things they've learned, drawing conclusions and evaluating. So the next time you're grabbing an activity for science and social studies, really as a teacher, critically evaluate what you're looking at. Are there questions that are going to ask students their opinion? Is there a question that the answer is not actually in the article, but they have to take the information from the article and apply it in a new context? Is there an opportunity for students to synthesize by pulling information from a variety of sources, say they've had different learning opportunities about the same topic? So if you're talking about elections, for example, if you are using, is there an opportunity if you've had students read an article about how elections work, but you've also watched a video, you've also had a class discussion, are there questions that allow students to be able to synthesize and bring all of that information together to say summarize in their own words how an election works? It's really important that the resources and the materials that we're using are more than just knowledge and understanding type questions because we're not going to build critical thinking if we're simply just giving students knowledge and understanding questions and not pushing them to do those extra steps. And these are the extra steps that we really need. That critical thinking piece is really where we're going and what we need. Another step is the metacognition. Now metacognition pops up in almost every aspect, every strand, every subject across our curriculum. There is a metacognitive piece that is involved. Metacognition is simply getting you to think about your thinking process. So in mathematics, that is explaining your thinking, showing what you're doing, understanding the process of how you learned something. This metacognition piece, this thinking about thinking, is a really important part when we're building critical thinking skills. It's not simply enough that they get the right answer, but we also want to make sure that our students understand the process of getting the right answer. Now, this is the area that we combat some of these chat GPT things. I've heard a lot of teachers or people or parents on social media really worried about this AI writing tools that are all over the internet right now. But the reality is, is that that only is going to take a student so far. Sure, an AI writing tool is going to be able to write a paragraph for students, but will it be able, will they be able to explain their process? Will they understand what facts are correct? What facts are not correct? Because I've used it and sometimes the facts are not always correct. So we want to make sure that students can analyze the answers they're using in these AI writing tools, analyze the research that they can gather. There's immense amount of benefit of using tools such like this to aid student research, but we need to have them analyze what is correct and what is not. We have to have them critically think about whether or not they should include something or not include something. But the reality is, is that we need students to be able to explain their process. How did they come up with that conclusion? Why did they think that? They can talk to us about how they developed that conclusion. If they simply just put the question into an AI tool and it spit it out and the student didn't actually do the work or the thinking process isn't there, we know that they haven't really done the work. It has to be about the thinking process. So asking our students what their process was, how they came to that conclusion, what information brought them to that inf to that conclusion, that is really what we're looking for. And that's where that metacognitive piece is going to take us to that next level and help to build and develop those critical thinking tools. Another strategy here is modeling. As teachers, one of the ways that we can teach students critical thinking skills is by actually modeling it ourselves. When we are reading something, we need to model what it means to think about the things that we're reading how to make an inference, how to make a connection, how to make a connection that's a lot deeper that goes into some inferential details that we want to have them not just look for similarities, but actually dig into the bottom of that iceberg and look for connections to meanings and to deeper understandings. We need to show students how we can determine what the theme or message is of the text we're reading, not just retelling the events in the order in which they occurred. 
A retell is simply just regurgitating the information in the order. But when we're asking students to summarize a text, when we're asking students to determine the message or the theme of the story, we're asking them to dig a little bit deeper, go beyond what they've learned, synthesize that information. But in order to do that, we need to model it. We need to show them what that looks like. We need to make our thinking really explicit. This happens in math as well, because we need to show students how we think about solving math. There's so much to be said about the new ways that we teach math and that we're not just necessarily teaching the standard algorithm, but we are teaching students how to critically think about math. We're also uncovering the thinking that is happening in our heads that we take for granted. Some students will just automatically start to think that way. We need to actually explicitly teach the ways that we think about math, the ways others think about math and show them by taking all of those thoughts that are in our brain and making them very visible to students. Explaining your process, explaining why you're doing the things that you're doing is an invaluable tool in the classroom to help build and model and develop critical thinking. It also means we want to give them real life problems. We don't want the classroom to be this microcosm of things that only happen in the classroom. So the students sort of show up into our classroom and they're like, okay, this is where I am for five hours a day. And then I go back home and I'm in the real world. And they just sort of like turn it on and turn it off. We want it to be a continual flow where they see the real world in their classroom. They see the real world applications of why they're learning different things. And sometimes the answer is, well, why are you learning about government in grade five? Well, because that's what we're supposed to be talking about. But it's also really important to talk about issues that are happening right now in our government. It is important to talk about the difficult topics or to bring in, if we're talking about the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, bring in actual cases, actual case studies and cases in front of the Supreme Court that have been debated about how the charter is applied and how the charter is challenged. It's one of the most favorite activities that my students use in my government unit is the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms case studies. It's one of my favorite lessons to do and also one of my students' favorites is the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms case study lesson where they learn about the charter rights and what they are and what rights we have, but then they actually get to read different scenarios that are based on actual case law of situations and cases that have come in front of the Supreme Court of Canada and challenged charter rights. Having students read through that case law brings the real world into the classroom. Now, obviously the case law has been simplified into situations that are very easy to understand for students, so it makes it accessible. But to understand that they know that there was actually a case that came in front of the Supreme Court about with Shoppers Drug Mart and poinsettias and religious freedom and how that was argued and what the results of it were. All of those are very important to recognize and to bring the real world into the classroom. The same can be said when learning about habitats, when learning about Indigenous communities, all of those are important to actually bring in the real world, the real issues that are happening outside and bring them in. We can talk about the problems the world is facing right now with using lots of different things, with using actual examples from within their community, and why not? It helps them to see that the real world is happening and it helps them to be able to think critically about important topics that actually are happening in their world. The next thing we can do in our classroom to build critical thinking is to embrace curiosity in our room. Curiosity, choice, voice, actually asking our students what they want to learn, what they want to know more about. It is curiosity is the reason why I embrace inquiry so much. It is why I am a big advocate and proponent of using inquiry-based instruction in your classroom that all students are able to do some level of inquiry. 
Inquiry, however, when we boil it down, comes to curiosity. If we just start with curiosity and we add a little bit of choice and voice, we add a little bit of them into the classroom, we follow some of their curiosities, their leads, we ask them to ask questions, all of that is going to lead to building the critical thinking because they're going to be more engaged in something that is important to them versus something that is important to us. So we need to be asking them questions. We need to be asking them what they're interested in. Maybe they don't know. So we just have to watch. There is always this little spark where they get like curious or animated about something we mention. Instead of just going over it or instead of being worried that we're going to get lost on a tangent, sometimes it's okay to stop what you had planned and follow the tangent. Because sometimes the the nuggets of gold that that tangent leads us to, that that little spark of curiosity and what that leads us to in the classroom is more valuable than what I had planned on my lesson plan. And it's not going to happen all the time, but sometimes it's okay. Sometimes it's okay to forget what you had planned and to notice when students all of a sudden get that spark of engagement, they get a really animated um, sometimes it could be simply about some controversial topic that was somewhat mentioned. You watch a video about food and they start going off on a tangent about whether or not avocados are environmentally friendly. And if you just sort of gloss it over and didn't go with it, you might not ever get students to discover what avocado, the impact of the environmental impact of an avocado is, or the environmental impact of almond milk versus cow milk, and which one is better for the environment. These are things that students have sparked curiosity, something that, you know, we were watching a video for health, and then it, they got animated about it. Now, I could have ignored it. I could have just sort of said, oh, thanks for your comment, and just sort of moved on with my lesson plan, or I can dig in. I can recognize that what I have is an opportunity. And this opportunity, I can follow and see where it goes. And sometimes it goes somewhere, sometimes it goes nowhere. But sometimes when it does go somewhere, I can then, instead of going the direction I wanted to go, or I had planned on going, I can follow their direction. I can still fit curriculum to their direction. I can still tie curriculum to what they wanna do, but what I've done here is I've built engagement. I've harnessed their curiosity and attached learning to them. Instead of me leading with the curriculum, always, I'm leading, I'm attaching the curriculum to things that they are interested in and they want to do. Now, sometimes I can anticipate where these go. Often after doing inquiry for a while, I can anticipate where different inquiry lines may travel where students are typically engaged in. They're always fairly engaged with the Charter of Rights and Freedoms and exploring that. They're always typically engaged with the environment and different ways that the government helps people. There's different elements that I know after years of doing the same activities, what is going to spark some debate, what's gonna spark some curiosity and where we can go with that. And that just takes some practice but we have to look for those opportunities. We have to embrace those opportunities and we have to really dig in and allow them to happen and be willing to go in a different direction and not feel bad or feel guilty or feel like we're wasting time, but instead just realign curriculum to the new direction you've traveled. And the curriculum can pretty much be aligned to anything you do. So just go with it sometimes and then lead them back along the path. But it's okay to take the road less path, the road less traveled. It's okay to take the offshoot path every once in a while, uh, especially when you notice that there's engagement. And that curiosity really builds that critical thinking piece. Finally, students need to know that their critical thinking skills are exactly what they need to do. That we are not just looking for their what the right answer is. A lot of the piece of this critical thinking, a lot of the questions that we're gonna ask, a lot of the things that we're gonna be doing, 
a lot of students get worried that the answer isn't right and that there is only one right answer. But the problem with critical thinking is it kind of challenges that understanding. There isn't always a right answer. When we're asking students to analyze things, when we're asking them to synthesize, when we're asking them to give their opinions, when we're asking them to draw conclusions, not all of their conclusions are gonna be exactly the same. And that's exactly what we want. But in order to get that, students are so conditioned and our system is so set up to expect that there is only one right answer. And I see this in emails that I get from teachers when they want answer pages for an inquiry question that's based on a critical thinking skill. And they want an answer page. And I have to reply and say, there's so many different answers. Here's an example. I can give you an example answer, but we also need to recognize that that's just an example and it's not the only right answer, that there are plenty of right answers. And part of the process in this building of critical thinking is validating for students that there isn't a right answer. Some answers are better than others, but the concept of black and white, right and wrong, isn't how a critical thinking question should be structured. There isn't a right or wrong answer. An answer is right when it can be supported with proof and evidence. An answer is a good answer, not right. An answer is a good answer when it is supported with proof and evidence, when your process is explained, when you have thought through your thinking and you can explain why you've come to that conclusion, when you can support your opinion. That's when your answer is good. Then instead of it being right or wrong, we have the scale of, is it a good answer? And not placing our own values or our own judgments on what the answer might be or what answers we're expecting. That we are open to hearing multiple answers, multiple processes, whether that's math or science or social studies or language. There are many different ways that a student can demonstrate their ability to organize ideas in a report or organize ideas in a story. There are many different ways that students can show their ability to write a figurative sentence. There isn't one right way. There isn't one right method. There isn't one right form of writing that every student must need to learn how to do all at the exact same time. Part of this critical thinking piece is allowing students the freedom and the flexibility to explore the things that they are curious about, explore the things that they are focused on, the things that light them up. But we need to give them feedback. We need to tell them it's okay. We need to tell them their answer is right. We need to tell them they did a good job. We need to tell them and validate multiple different right answers, that there isn't one right answer or another right answer, and these are wrong answers. But it's on a continuum scale of, is it good? Your answer's good. I like your answer, but it needs more support. Yes, I like your, your opinion is good. You have a strong opinion. I agree with your opinion. Or I don't agree with your opinion, but it's a good answer. Your opinion's completely different from mine, but you've backed it up and supported it. And that's totally fine. We need to give them that feedback. We need to validate their experience that when they are critical thinkers, we're not just looking for right and wrong. We are looking for good. And what does good look like? What are we looking for? How do we support? How do we provide evidence for our opinions? How do we answer those questions in ways that show our thinking, that show we were critical thinkers. What does that look like? And when we do that and we start validating that that's the kinds of answers we want, it's not the content of the answer, it's the quality of the answer, that's what we're providing feedback for our students and it helps them to build critical thinkers because we are encouraging them to think for themselves instead of thinking for us, thinking in ways that they're just doing it to make us happy. They're doing it just to give us the answer we want to hear. We need to give them the information that we don't want the answer we want to hear. We want their answer. 
We want their answer, their ideas, their opinions, and their thinking. And their thinking is more important than them thinking they need to please us with the right answer. So I hope this is giving you some food for thought on how you can integrate and build and support more critical thinking in your classroom. For more information, you can always find us here on YouTube, on our podcast, or on our website at www.madlylearning.com.